Good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the Salt Lake City Historic Landmarks Commission. Um, earlier this evening, 4 o'clock, we had a uh, field trip to visit the two uh, properties that are on the uh, public hearing portion of our agenda this evening. And then a number of commissioners were in attendance and then uh, had a brief dinner, and here we are starting up. Um, First item of business is approval of minutes from our last meeting. And if I have a motion or comments on that. I make a motion that we uh, approve the main meeting minutes from last meeting. Thank you, it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Still aye. Are we Oh, that's right. We need to do this individually. Well, then speak into the microphone, David. If you, all of us, all of us together. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? And I abstain. Okay. Thank you, Shelley. So the minutes have been approved. Um, I have no report from the chair or Kenton. Do you anything? Have anything from, no. as the vice chair? All right. Nick on the director's report side. Uh, you know, I don't think that I have anything to report tonight. Okay. Do we have any news of an arrival today? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess I can share that. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Which I forgot to bring a card for that, so I apologize. Yes, we'll so um, I think as everybody probably in the room knows, Michaela had her baby this week, and everything's good and healthy. And yes, the baby has Michaela's hair, so... <laughs> 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 There Excellent. you go. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, wish her well when you have communications with her. <clears throat> so we now have, have public comment period. Um, and I have a card from Mr. Stephen Pace who would like to address uh, probably the rehabilitation of 222 Fourth Avenue. So if you want to come up and just take one of the microphones, make sure the light's on. Thank you. And take a couple of minutes to uh, walk us through your. I, I hope you comments. all got copies. There's a thing I, uh, some paper that I passed out. I'm going to talk from it, but you might want to look at the last uh, page, which is a photograph from 1905 of the, uh, the site. Uh, this is sort of an anniversary. It's been 99 days as of today that uh, I've been trying to get uh, something rolling on this. I've uh, been completely frustrated. It's been an exercise that has not built any muscles. That is on top of about 30 years of uh, trying to figure out how to rehabilitate the last piece of this National Register site that I own, which is called the uh, William F. Beer uh, Estate. It consists of the four buildings that you can see in that summer of 1945 uh, photograph in front of you. Uh, the Beer Mansion on the left. Uh, there's something called the harness maker shop, which is in the middle, looks like a little monopoly house. And in the back of that is the carriage house, which is now in ruins. Since I bought that property, and I am just the second owner in, uh, since 18, the 1890s of this uh, piece of ground, uh, we've rehabilitated the beer mansion, uh, taken the 1870 harness maker shop and rehabilitated that rehabilitated a garage which was built after 1905 uh, which is on that picture and I've been trying to do the last thing on the estate which is to turn that carriage house back into a carriage house uh, and I want it to look exactly like what is in that photograph it's a fairly large building but we do know exactly what it looked like and we can measure it to within a tolerance of an inch or two if we were to get permission to rebuild it since I uh, have been trying to get uh, something going with the city in order to uh, uh, put this together, uh, I've tried in a bunch of dates that are shown on this uh, first page of the handout you've got uh, to see if we could rehabilitate it. Uh, butted my head against the wall now for 30 some odd years. The lot itself, and this is just the 222 Fourth Avenue lot, is about 8,500 square feet. I think it is the biggest piece of flat, unused ground in the uh, 
at least in any kind of close proximity to downtown. The carriage house, which is the white building in the uh, white roof building in the photograph, is on about 6,000 square feet of ground. I've been trying to figure out a use for it other than a dwelling unit, uh, and have struck out totally with the. Uh, city and with all the architects. Nobody suggested I do anything that made any economic sense with it other than to let it rot or scrape it off. It is individually listed on the National Register and I don't want to do that. Uh, the uh, uh, property, as I guess is no secret to any of you folks, since the city has adopted this policy of chasing the homeless out of downtown, the site is becoming increasingly attractive to transients who come and camp in the backyard or scavengers who, if they're polite, will come in and ask before they start digging up uh, the property around there or if not, just put their metal detectors out and uh, start digging and stealing things. Uh, the only thing that's saving the thing from being uh, totally obliterated by the increased homeless population up there, I think, is that it is in such lousy shape that people are afraid to go into it. it uh, the roof on it uh, is not look is collapsed in a couple of places, but it's still. Uh, I've rebuilt the other properties that which were in equally bad shape, and uh, I'd like to do this one. So. The, the purpose of me coming in here tonight, and if you flip to the uh, middle page of what I sent you, uh, this is what I kicked off with uh, uh, Councilman Wharton uh, 99 days ago. The suggestion I got, and I'll try and wrap this up in about a minute, the suggestion I got from Congressman Wharton and then also from the Deputy Planning Director to start off with was that we try a zoning uh, text amendment uh, to allow the city the flexibility to, uh, if other things were appropriate as far as the city was concerned, to let me rebuild that, uh, that property. I patterned that after the Ogden uh, rehab ordinance, so I believe what I suggested to the city is legal in Utah. It's been in effect in Ogden as a last resort rehab procedure for uh, historic register buildings that are uh, in danger of being lost. Uh, and the uh, uh, response I got was, well, send us a text amendment language, which I did. I got a call back saying, no, 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 this is too narrowly focused. We want to have a citywide adaptive reuse ordinance. Uh, I did talk to the, your deputy planning director and said, well, that means then apparently that uh, it would take, if it's citywide, it's going to take a, a bunch of time to research it and put it together, and it's going to take a whole bunch more time to deal with the public uproar. It's going to create, her response was, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I guess given that we're going on now 10 years, uh, for adaptive reuse without producing any reason, any effect on the housing stock in Salt Lake City. And we just saw probably the most colossal freak out politically in the, in the county on uh, the Olympia Hills project in the south end. I think there's something not making a whole lot of sense about a bunch of the way the city is trying to plan this stuff. If it were me, I'd do stuff small scale, a bit at a time, in places where it doesn't piss off the neighborhood, try to learn from it, and then move on. But uh, the city's position is it's apparently that it's more important to preserve the zoning uh, procedures than it is to preserve the landmarks. Mm. And uh, that's a few minutes of what I've uh, okay. been concerned about, and I would very much you know, if you're interested, like to come back and talk, you know, if you've got 15 minutes in some future agenda to uh, right. talk some more specifically about some of the issues that I see being raised in this. Okay. Well, I think, um, I think some of the issues that, you know, important issues raised and, and important needs present um, at that location, certainly. And um, I think what the right thing to do is probably ask staff to give us a report perhaps at the next commission meeting and give us a little update and background on this because this is all new I think to probably everyone on the commission and perhaps uh, schedule as part of a, a future work session if appropriate on a on a future night of the of the commission so thank you very much okay, uh, thank you for listening to me obviously a, a well uh, developed proposal here and things and we'll and we'll certainly uh, work I, through it I hope so thank you okay thank you Um, there are no other uh, sort of general 
uh, preservation uh, public comments this evening. We'll start with uh, item number one on our agenda, which is the National Register nomination for the house at 701 I Street, the Lowell and Emily Parrish house. And Sarah, if you'd like to take us through that, hopefully you'll get all th four screens there. Thank you. I'm still working on um, loading the presentation, but should have it in just a minute. Getting closer. Getting close. Getting closer. Getting closer. There we go. Yay. Thank you. So, yes, this is a review of a National Register nomination for the Lowell and Emily Parish House, which is located at 701 North I Street. And as a certified local government, the Historic Landmarks Commission has the opportunity to review National Register nominations and provide a recommendation to the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service. The State Historic Preservation Review Board will be reviewing this nomination on August 2nd and um, just wanted to go over a few of the details of it this evening. So as I mentioned, this is a nomination for the Lowell and Emily Parish House. It's located at 701 North I Street. It's located north of 13th Avenue and it's on the west side of I Street. The property is nominated for Criterion C, its significance in architecture. It's an early example of the Rydian modern style. It was designed by Lowell Parish for his family it was built in 1951 and served as his resident, served as the family's residence until his early death in 1960. This particular style wasn't common in Utah at that time, and the other examples of it are from later in the 50s or the 1960s. It was included in an Avenues Extension Survey in 1994, and at that time it was designated out of period, but staff's opinion is that it would be considered contributing if it was resurveyed. You can see here, um, the east elevation facing I Street, and the I Street elevation um, in the nomination is considered a secondary facade. And then you can see the south and the east elevation in the lower image. And then there are two historic photos here with similar views, the top of the south and the east photo, and then the south photo, also a historic photo. So staff recommends a positive recommendation to the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service, um, believing that the Lowell and Emily Parish House retains its architectural integrity. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions <coughs> for staff about this nomination? If not, and we don't have anyone to speak publicly towards this, so we'll just, uh, and we just, take a majority vote on this to, I mean, and we don't need to worry about majority, I think this is gonna be fine. Um, Do we have anybody from SHPO here? No. No? Um, still open it up for uh, public. Oh, certainly. Comment. Is there anyone else would like to speak to this? David, if you're interested? Okay. <laughs> we'll take that. Um, if not executive session, then we'll enter that. And uh, any discussion on the nomination or a motion? I'm ready to present a motion. I move that we uh, send a positive uh, recommendation to the SHPO to nominate 701 North I Street to the National Register of Historic Places. All right, David's made that positive motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, thank you. Any, any question? Do um, you want to start voting then, all in favor? Uh, Quist, yes. Harding, yes. Petro Ashler, yes. Richardson, I. So, I. Peters, I. Brennan, I. Hyde, I. All right. So that motion passes. We'll send that recommendation on to Shippo. And if you want to hand me that paper at some point, we'll move that on. All right. Thanks. We'll now go to uh, item number two on the agenda, the Bishop Place Economic Hardship Applications for the nine properties at approximately 432 North, 300 West. Um, Amy Thompson will present, and I believe Paul and Nick at some point, when do you want to talk about the process? I think for as a preliminary matter, um, Commissioner Harding uh, wants to present uh, some information as to uh, potential appearance, <laughs> conflict. 
Okay, so as I was re reviewing the materials in preparation for today, I saw there was a, quite a bit of focus on Louis Francis. So Louis Francis and I were co-clerks um, at the Utah Court of Appeals about 21 years ago, or maybe a little longer. He was the best friend of a boyfriend I had at the time, and we spent quite a bit of time together. Um, I haven't seen him in probably 15 years or so, but I do have a high opinion of him. Um, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, it doesn't mean that I would be swayed in, in one way or the other, but totally candidly, I would pay attention to what he had to say because I think he's a smart attorney. But it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be evidence to contradict that. But I just wanted to put it out there that I know Lewis and I have a good opinion of him and just see what everyone thinks of that. Commissioners, are there any concerns or observations you'd like to make about that well, statement? Well, I also know Lewis socially, uh, but not professionally. Um, he's a member of the Alta Club, good standing, I might add. Uh, and we personally traveled on a historical uh, trip to Havana several years ago. But uh, we don't really cross paths. So from a, a technical, legal uh, perspective, provided that there's no financial um, issues at stake here, um, if, if commissioners believe that they cannot uh, make a decision in an unbiased way because of their relationship with uh, Mr. Francis. I think that would be an issue, but otherwise uh, there's, there's nothing that uh, the ordinance would um, present as a bar to participation. And I don't feel that way. I just wanted to put it on the record in case anyone was uncomfortable okay. with it. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the other commissioners on that topic? Thank you. <clears throat> um, now, let me go back to you two gentlemen. Do um, you want to do overview on, on the process or, or Amy's gonna handle things first? I have a little spot in my okay. initial overview and All right, then I then. was gonna turn the time over to him. Sounds good. Uh, so this is a request from property owner Don Armstrong. He's represented by uh, Bruce Baird for a determination of economic hardship to allow for demolition of nine contributing structures on or near Bishop Place, which is approximately 432 North uh, 300 West. I'm just gonna give a quick overview of what's happened so far in the process, uh, and then I'm happy to answer any questions and um, I'll turn the time over to Paul and the applicant. Uh, after de and demolition is de denied, the city has an economic hardship process to allow the applicant the opportunity to demonstrate whether the denial deprives the applicant of all reasonable economic use or return on the subject property. As part of this process, a three-person economic hardship review panel was established. One person was appointed by the Landmark Commission, one person was appointed by the applicant, and the third member was appointed by the mayor. Uh, the review panel held a public meet on meeting on April 11th. They also held a public hearing at that meeting. At that meeting, they asked the applicant to come back with additional information uh, specifically related to tax credits, and so they did not come to any conclusions at that meeting. The second meeting was held on May 15th, and the panel did make finding, findings and conclusions at that meeting, um, the, and then they included those findings and conclusions in the report of the economic review panel that was forwarded to you all. Um, and then following that, the applicant submitted additional information uh, that's also been forwarded to you and included in your Dropbox. So the review panel concluded that they found an economic hardship with six of the properties. And they concluded that there was not an economic hardship with three of the properties. Did I say six before? I'll go back. <laughs> um, so as far as the Landmark Commission's decision, it must be consistent with the findings and conclusions of the Economic Hardship Panel unless the Commission finds by three-fourths of a quorum that the review panel either acted arbitrarily or based the report on erroneous findings of fact. Um, and I'll have Paul go over some additional information to that. And then I do have to help facilitate the discussion tonight, I do have um, this image up on the screen. It includes a photo of the property, the petition number, um, an aerial map, and then the numbers in the corner are the same numbers that uh, the report of the hardship panel and the engineering report refers to the buildings as buildings one, two, through nine. 
Um, and then also just a reminder, the, this application is vested under the old economic hardship standards. So I do have printouts of those available too, if anyone needs those. And at this point, I can turn the time over to Paul. So just as a, a preliminary matter, um, process, uh, this is something that uh, none of you have been through. Um, something that I haven't been through. So this is this is the first time for all of us. Um, and as you're all well, well aware, uh, there has been a, a recent uh, amendment to the uh, ordinance as it pertains to hardship and demolition. And uh, hopefully we improve those things. We are operating, as Amy said, under the, um, the former ordinance. Um, and as Amy indicated, uh, your role is to uh, take in the evidence, um, including very specifically the uh, findings and conclusions of the economic hardship panel. Um, and, and let me let me sort of underline something that Amy said. Uh, it's a three quarters majority of the commission uh, required to overturn or to reject. Uh, some or all of the panel's findings, if there is an erroneous, oh, I'm going to read it because it's clumsy. Uh, if the Landmark Commission finds by a vote of three-fourths the majority of a quorum present that the Economic Hardship Review Panel acted in an arbitrary manner or that its report was based on an erroneous finding of a material fact. So material is an important word there. Um, if uh, if you think that there was an error in their findings on something that's in insignificant, then um, you know we'll just let that dog lie. But uh, it has to be something that's uh, critical to the uh, the standards and the purposes of, of this process. Um, so back to the three quarters of a majority uh, of a, it's of a quorum present. There are nine of you here. Your rules state that the chair doesn't vote unless there's a tie. If there's a tie, we're not hitting three-fourths anyways. Um, so because you have nine here and we've got to reach at least 75%, we need a vote of seven of the members here um, in order to, uh, to reject the findings of that economic hardship seven panel. Without Charles. Seven with Charles. It's, it's awkward. It says three quarters of a quorum present, and the chair counts towards that quorum. Um, so there we are with that. Um, if there is a finding of economic hardship, I'm just going to read this straight from the old ordinance. Um, if after reviewing all of the evidence, the Historic Landmark Commission finds that the application of the standards set forth in subsection K2 of this section results in economic hardship, then the Historic Landmark Commission shall issue a certificate of appropriateness for demolition. There are the additional steps of working through uh, the building permits and making sure they have a reuse plan, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but um, that does, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to come back for a, a review of whether it meets demolition standards because we've been through that. Um, and let me just say one more thing uh, on a slightly different note. Um, the whole purpose of economic hardship is to determine if we are uh, treading in that area of a regulatory taking by the city um, by prohibiting a property owner from using their property in a way that um, they have a, an economic expectation. Um, I submitted a, a memo to the hardship panel and I, that should be included in your materials on some of the, uh, the Supreme Court case law surrounding this stuff. Um, these are delicate issues and um, if at some point in this meeting the commission that uh, having a discussion session to discuss pending or uh, likely litigation um, we can do that there actually is pending litigation there was an appeal filed on the previous denial of demolition um, but uh, in my opinion there would be um, uh, grounds to have a closed meeting if you determine that that's necessary on um, pending or reasonably imminent litigation uh, with respect to a potential takings claim. Um, there's that. I, I don't know that we need to go there. I, I think I've kind of spelled out the, in the memo um, 
what that means, but I just wanted to make you aware that there's that option. There are requirements. Uh, it's another supermajority vote. It's not a three quarters, um, but it's, I don't think it's a three quarters. I'll double check that. Let me know. Um, with that, I'm kind of out of things to say, and hopefully I don't have to say anything else tonight. I don't have anything else either, but I can turn the time over to the applicant or I'm happy to answer any questions. Is any questions for staff or I guess for Paul at this point as well? Topics? If not, um, the applicant, please come forward and uh, present. And then when you're finished, there will be, I have cards for three people who wish to speak. And if there's others who wish to speak, please um, grab a card from the, out from the entry door. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning uh, Historic Landmark Commission. My name is Bruce Beard. I'm counsel for the project uh, for IRES. Mr. Don Armstrong is here with me. Uh, I will be brief for several reasons. First of all, I'm sure you've all read my letter. Uh, I want to apologize in getting it to you late. I I sent it along with a large package of materials. The email server for the city bounced it back, and when I resent it, I attached the wrong letter. Uh, so I apologize. I figured that out when I talked to Paul the other day and resent it. Um, so it's my fault, and when I make a mistake, I acknowledge it. Um, I also want to thank uh, Amy and Michaela for their excellent staff work in this. They've done a good job of coordinating uh, a difficult argument. The other reason I want to be brief is I can count. Uh, and the odds on me getting seven of you to determine that these buildings should be torn, the, the four that should be torn down are, are pretty close to zero. I'm going to try, but uh, I can read tea leaves, and I've been here before, so I'm not going to waste your time a lot on that. Uh, and the odds on getting seven of you to vote against the uh, six the buildings that were recommended for being torn down based off of a lack of evidence is should zero, should be zero, so I won't waste a lot of time on that. Uh, Mr. Richardson, you asked at uh, dinner uh, how how you should react if I attacked members of the HLC personally, and I guess you didn't see me hiding in the back uh, in plain sight. But I, I, I don't intend to attack anybody uh, personally here uh, on on this panel. I've done enough of that with uh, the. Uh, excrescent Mr. Francis. Um, I did have a few biblical verses that I was going to quote since I quoted Monty Python in my brief. I was going to quote from Matthew and Jeremiah, but I'll let you guess which those verses were because some people might interpret them as an attack and I'd rather not do that. So let me talk about the legal basis for tearing the six buildings down. Uh, the six buildings are beyond any doubt in anyone's mind uh, going to fall down. It's just a matter of when, not if, and they cannot possibly be fixed. We submitted a book of evidence <laughs> that complied with all of the city's utterly unintelligible standards and standards that I should acknowledge the city repeatedly admitted were unintelligible, uh, but we submitted the book anyway. Uh, two members of the panel found that the book was sufficient. I think based on, oh, sorry, I can't lift it one-handed. Based on mere weight, it would be impossible for anyone to find that those six buildings did not meet the standards to be torn down. Uh, we had an engineering report. We had an economic report. We had appraisals. We did everything we could possibly do on those six buildings. We also did everything we could do on the four, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the four when I talk about the four or three, because one of them's a duplex. So that's what's, sometimes it gets confusing whether there's nine buildings or 10 buildings. Uh, so we usually refer to it as 432, which is the big building on Third West, the duplex, and the yellow house. That's the common nomenclature in all of the hearings. Uh, so let me just take a few seconds to talk about the six reasons that are in my letter or the five reasons that were in my letter. I, I won't repeat them in detail, but 
I have no idea how Mr. Francis could possibly have been qualified under the legal standard. Uh, I have no idea how he uh, is not inherently biased. Uh, he didn't disclose uh, a bias that he had, and he blackballed a chairperson of the committee to be chosen by the mayor. Uh, be claiming that uh, respected lawyer Scott Sabe and respected city council member Chris McCandless were unqualified and inherently biased. Uh, that alone shows his bias. If you just read the transcript of his commentary, uh, you will notice that essentially no question he asked made any sense. Uh, he was misapplying the standards completely. The third reason is, as I point out in my letter, that your code is unintelligible. And by definition, if your code is unintelligible, it's not just tie goes to the runner. It isn't even, it isn't even if it's close. We win if it's amb ambiguous. And even Mr. Francis acknowledged that it was ambiguous. Uh, Ms. O'Grady acknowledged that it was ambiguous. If I remember the last time I was here, about six of these buildings on the first set of go-arounds, uh, members of this panel acknowledged that it was ambiguous. Uh, I, I believe your staff has acknowledged that it's ambiguous. The Utah Supreme Court uh, and now the Utah Legislature are 100% clear that when something is ambiguous, tie goes to the private property owner because zoning laws are in derogation of private property rights. Uh, if, if you just acknowledge the mere fact that it's illegal, I'm sorry, that it's ambiguous, then we have to win. Because in addition to the standards that Mr. Nielsen put up uh, and Amy put up and talked about, the material fact, etc., illegality is always a standard of review that an appeal authority can deal with. And the fact that your code is, is so ambiguous means that it is illegal um, and it needs to be fixed. I, I, I beg you to fix the code. I think I did that nine months ago uh, and begged you to fix the code when many of you acknowledged that it was ambiguous. To date, unfortunately, because I'm so sure you're so busy and the city staff is so busy uh, with the development boom that we've got going, they haven't had a chance to figure out how to deal with this uh, little nuisance of a problem. The, final, the next to final reason is that there was absolutely no evidence submitted by anyone to the contrary to establish the hardship. Now there was some speculation, especially on the, are the buildings going to fall over tomorrow or are they gonna fall over next week? And there was some speculation that perhaps tax credits might miraculously help, but there was no evidence and no math. This is simply a question of math. Uh, can the buildings be restored economically or have you take, constituted a taking? It's not a question of math of whether the five standards, three of them are met or not. That's absurd. Uh, and the only person who believed that, further emphasizing his bias and his incompetence, was Mr. Francis. The other two members of the panel didn't bother to think that. And it clearly makes no sense when you're dealing with a constitutional taking merely to see whether there's three or five factors. The question is very simple. Can the buildings be restored economically or is the city effectively taking them by denying the right to demolish them and forcing them to stay up? The city cannot force my client to waste more money and pour good money down a rat hole. There's that old joke that a boat is just a hole in the water in which you throw money. Uh, many times without uh, an unlimited budget, and Mr. Richardson, I know this is your business, you would probably know better than almost anybody how much it costs to restore historic buildings. Ironically, you probably would have been, quali you would have been qualified to be on this panel. Now, I might have objected because you might have been a little biased given your historic bent, but you would have been qualified. Uh, there's no doubt you would have been qualified. Uh, hell, you, you might be the only person I can think of who's actually qualified under the new standard, which is pretty hard to get somebody qualified under the new standard. Finally, the, the panel simply misunderstood the law and applied the facts and, mis and misapplied the facts. And it's, and, it's, and it's really beyond doubt. All they said was, hmm, tax credits are available. Therefore, check the box number five on the standards. Well, 
Tax credits may be available, but that doesn't matter. The tax credits are unusable to this landowner in any material way to make the economics of this building, fun these, of this restoration function. And I've run through that in the letter that we attached from the accountant. I've summarized my testimony to the, my statements to the uh, panel in the letter. Uh, the, the, the function, uh, the focus, uh, the fetish focus on, fetishistic focus on whether these buildings were going to fall down tomorrow, as Ms. O'Grady said, is there a quote, fatal defect, close quote? Well, that fatal defect is not the test. The question, because as we all know, everything can be restored, it just costs a lot of money. So I, I would, in conclusion, I, and I took a little longer than I expected, and I, and I hate reading something that you should have already read, but I'm going to do it anyway just for impact. The seventh page of the letter from Mr. Condor, and we, we submitted this supplemental letter because it seemed that some members of the panel were just lost in how to apply the actual engineering standards. The seventh page of the letter from Mr. Condor, uh, which is the signature page where he stamps it, uh, professional structural engineer. The, uh, the antepenultimate paragraph reads, the extent of the repairs identified above, and that's regarding uh, one, four, and nine, which is the duplex 432 in the yellow house, that are required to bring the buildings within the minimum code requirements for life safety are cost prohibitive. Repairs would require the building's foundations, floors, walls, and roofs to be rebuilt. There would be little, if any, of the original structure remaining. The expected costs of repair are typically a minimum of three to four times the cost of new construction. It is my recommendation that due to the cost to repair these buildings, that these three buildings should be removed instead of repaired. That is simply a summary of the testimony he had presented to the panel, but because some people on the panel seemed to be confused about it, we asked him to write it in short, plain English sentences. So we would respectfully request that you find the obvious, that the panelist's decision on the six buildings is sustain, sustained by substantial evidence. And by the way, Paul will tell you, and you probably already know, that substantial evidence is defined in Utah as that evidence which, if standing alone, would support a reasonable person reaching that conclusion. There's no possible way that that book doesn't constitute substantial evidence on the sixth buildings. And to the contrary, the substantial evidence, the evidence supporting the panel's decision on the four buildings is this blank piece of glass. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions for the applicant from commissioners? If not, um, oh, go ahead, David. One question. Um, sure. Why is it that you chose to push this through under the old ordinance when given the option of doing it under the new ordinance? Uh, th that's a really good question, uh, and the answer was, was tactical at the time, and I don't want to go into it, Mr. Richardson. Sometimes you make decisions about where you go um, for reasons that, that you think are right at the time. Uh, well, I'll, I'll be blunt. I didn't think that the Historical Landmark Commission would choose an utterly unqualified, biased person, and I didn't assume that the, uh, the utterly unqualified and biased person would blackball rational people like Scott Sabe and Chris McCandless. And I assumed, obviously I made a bad, bad mistake, I assumed that a rational Historic Landmark Commission would evaluate, I'm sorry, Economic Hardship Panel, would evaluate the massive and uncontradicted evidence and reach the conclusion. I didn't know whether uh, a more politically appointed body might reach the same conclusion. Uh, so it's tactical? Tactical, absolutely. Okay. Or strategic, whichever you want to call it. <laughs> I, we, we, can, we can get into a fight from von Clausewitz about what's the difference between strategy and tactics. But the applicant had a vested right under the old ordinance. Right. Yeah, Dave's right. But it was a, it's a legitimate question. Uh, and sometimes tactics work and sometimes they don't. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Oops, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kenton. 
Yeah, Mr. Baird, would you quickly refresh our memory as to the process, how things changed from when the property was purchased and the deal was made with RDA? Clearly, clearly it seems that the concept for your client was that this was viable. What happened to what, change that picture? Sure. What, what happened is uh, some, uh, that was based on, uh, the estimates were based on some preliminary sketch plans which we believed would be able to be turned into building permits. And when it came down to getting a structural engineer to actually look at the project to determine whether it could be repaired or not, no structural engineer would touch the project and give it a stamp of approval with three latex gloves because the buildings simply cannot be restored. So what we've gone back and looked at is, okay, in reality, and, and as I told the, uh, the, the panel, uh, I'm reminded of the, the famous quote from Maynard, John Maynard Keynes when he was asked why he changed his opinion on deficit spending in the Depression. He said, when I find that the facts upon which I've based my opinion have changed, I reconsider my opinion. So what happened was we looked at a more detailed analysis afterwards and simply determined that based on real facts and real building codes and current codes and current requirements, it simply doesn't pencil. So that's what happened. One was uh, perhaps optimistic and, and early. The other is more detailed and more concerned and more careful. Uh, and we, we demonstrated that in great detail. And uh, uh, essentially every member of the panel understood that except Mr. Francis. So the original purchase was a technical error. If no, you will. no, there's no showing that Mr. De and, I, and I addressed this in my letter. Uh, that's factor A in the hardship analysis, which is did you buy the property knowing that it was uh, historical? Assuming that we dramatically overpaid for it, that would potentially be a tactical error as you're talking about. People make purchases based on the assumptions of what they think is going to happen, what they think the building code is, what they, th what they base, they talk to planning staff, they talk to building staff, and they're told what they think they can do, and they run pro formas based off of those numbers and make a purchase based off of that. When you subsequently do uh, more detailed analysis, sometimes it turns out you've made a bad decision. And, and, I, and I see that for clients all day. And I'm sure Mr. Richardson sees that from clients. When client comes in with a building and they say, I want to fix this building. And Dave gives them the bill and they go, holy crap, you're kidding me. If, I bet you he would confirm that. Thank you. Other questions for the applicant? If not, we have, um, thank you very much. We have. Thank you. Um, three members of the public here this evening that wish to speak to this, and then you'll have an opportunity, as you know, to respond Thank after you. that. Um, first, uh, David Shear, and um, we have a few extra minutes. We could probably give him three or four minutes if we need to, but t please focus your comments. Uh, David Shear, David uh, Amott, and then uh, Cindy Cromer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's David Shear. Um, I am here to support the economic hardship panel's finding that no economic hardship exists for 248 Bishop Place, 265 and 67 Bishop Place, and 432 North 300 West, 300 West. The panel found that the applicant knew that these and the other Bishop Place properties were within an historic district and subject to the jurisdiction of this commission when they were purchased. It seems to me, being an architect, not a lawyer, um, that any loss of value of these properties cannot be due to the Commission's denial of a demolition permit, since in so doing, the, commercial, the, the, the Commission was acting under ordinances in effect when the applicant purchased the property and was fully aware of. It appears to me that the applicant did not take the impact of these ordinances properly into account in their decision to purchase the properties. If I had been uh, the applicant's architect, I would certainly have advised him that there was a great deal of uncertainty inherent in the process of obtaining approval to pursue the plan that he presented and that there was certainly a great deal of reason to be concerned about the structure of those buildings just 
looking at them. It's a little um, hard to believe that it took an engineer to determine the fact that these buildings were not economically restorable. So um, I don't think that it's incumbent upon this commission to save the applicant from the consequences of what in hindsight was a bad business decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. David, Cindy, no, Cindy, that's fine. I don't care. Um, there's a copy for, uh, there are two copies, um, one of each document, and there's copies for each person, including the staff. Oh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> My name is Cindy Cromer. Claudia O'Grady, a member of the Economic Hardship Panel, and I are the only two people who have participated in the process for Bishop Place and the prior one, which was for Marikia Townhouses. With a record of over 2,000 pages, I can only provide bullet points tonight. The most important one is that there be a public process with integrity and that the Commission do what it is charged to do within the ordinance. We have already had an absence of civility, and we are likely to see legal maneuvering complements of prior litigation and the state legislature. It is important for the public process and your review to be stellar. Our efforts need to be stellar because we have not seen a threat to so many contributory buildings in a city historic district since the demolition of Vernier Court. The site plan generated by the applicants shows two developable lots. I believe that there are two others based on permissions which the city could grant. That is four new buildable lots which I did not hear about in the two meetings of the Economic Hardship Panel. Those are lots four, five, six, and seven. Lot four is really huge. Based on my own research and a purchase a year and a half ago, these lots are worth at least $100,000 each. That is what I paid per unit, and I found a parcel comparable to the ones on Bishop Place which sold were $150,000 a year and a half ago. That math is absent. With the Marikia townhouses, the Commission sent the results of the Economic Hardship Panel to the RDA to resolve discrepancies. The outcome was that the RDA found that the sixplex, which you have a picture of, could not be considered an economic hardship because of its density. It still stands. Making a profit is all about density, and the existing zoning allows more density on this site than the Economic Hardship Panel has considered with the historic buildings in place. So it's all about density. That's the name of the game. And that has not been the focus. I own 600 square foot frame structure without a foundation. I plan to move it a little bit and capture the state and federal tax credits or move it two blocks without the tax credits. Either way, I do not expect to lose money. Thanks. Very much. David, let's, let's invite uh, first up uh, Griffin Jenkins. You want to come? Uh, my name is Griffin Jenkins. I live at 466 North 3rd West, which is about 250 feet from Bishop Place. Um, our neighborhood is under attack from the north with the huge uh, development proposed for Library Square. From this area is one of the last few low-density old neighborhoods, the, the last old neighborhood left in this part of the city. Um, this loss would be a serious loss to the neighborhood and totally unwarranted. Uh, Mr. Peters brought up the point that what did the RDA see when they brought the loan in? I w wish I had pictures. I've lived at this place for t since 2007. I wish I had pictures before, the pla before Bishop Place was sold. Everything on there was rehabbable. When the RDA went in and gave their approval and their approval for the loan, everything in there was rehabitable. It was since it has been under the custodianship of Mr. Armstrong that it has reached this condition. This condition that looks like 20 years of neglect took less than five. They actually, if you go in and check the develop, check for uh, the planning, the building commission, or there's a, whoever puts out the red tag, the stop work order, you will find that one was served on every building on there for unpermitted demolition, which meant gutting, basically. They tore all weather and stripping off. They gutted the interiors. They tore out windows, roofs, anything. These buildings were all 200, 2,000% more rehabable before Mr. Armstrong began work. If there is any economic hardship on this, I agree, it was a terrible business decision. 
He is asking the city to excuse him from being dumb. He, is, he says he paid 800000 for this according to official records. Now, according to my best research, they are asking $10 million as a selling price. It's 1,200% increase. Um, and from some research, Mr. Baird is hardly unknown in Salt Lake. My best estimates that I can get from rather educated sources is that Mr. Armstrong has paid somewhere between $750,000 and $1 million in legal fees and for the book of which they are so proud. Is this someone with economic hardships? If he had paid that much on restoring these, this would not be a question. He would be embraced in the neighborhood. My last point, if these pass, what is his proposal? What is his replacement? A green space? Is he going to fence it off? Is it going to be a locked off gated empty space? Or is he going to leave it open for Salt Lake's recently displaced homeless community? What is the proposal? What is he going to do if he, t if he gets his permissions to tear these down? Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. David. Good evening. Um, I'm not here necessarily representing myself, but the organization for which I work, which is Preservation Utah. Um, speaking for Preservation Utah, we were not entirely satisfied with the results of the economic hardship panel, um, but we do see adopting the recommendation of this panel as the best way to preserve any piece of Bishop's Place. Um, Ultimately, discussing this with Kirk, we were uh, concerned about precedent to accept the developer's arguments um, would, regarding Bishop Place would send the message, as Griffin Jenkins just indicated, that if you purchase buildings within a historic district, let them decay and then push, 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 push against the city, you can ultimately redevelop your property largely as you like. Despite what the developer says, tax credits can be used to rehabilitate um, the properties, the three that were selected to, uh, to stand by the economic um, review panel. There is a letter from Roger Roper, the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer, in the public record regarding this, this, this property that indicates that depending on what the developer wishes to do, he could get up to 40% of tax credits on all eligible rehab costs. Um, finally, maintaining at least the three buildings selected by the economic review panel to stand would at least acknowledge that there is a Capitol Hill local historic district and that Bishop's Place is within that district. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you all for your comments. Um, thank you for focusing on the on the issues at hand. Um, Mr. Baird, I presume, would like to respond? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I will address the uh, points raised by the neighbors of uh, Siri Autumn. Uh, Mr. Shear only focused on factor A, which I frankly acknowledged. Uh, up front, but it doesn't matter because factor A doesn't impact whether this constitutes a taking. It's simply a math question. It's not a question of did you buy it unless some evidence is there that it was overpaid for at the time, and there is no evidence to that effect in the record. The record is utterly devoid of that evidence. I found it interesting, and if I have to cite it to the district court, I'm happy to do so. Mr. Shear actually essentially agreed that the buildings were, quote, in his words, not my words, his words, economically unrestorable. I agree. The buildings are economically unrestorable, and that ends the argument. Ms. Cromer, I, I, as much as I respect Ms. Cromer, uh, all she did was speculate about what a building might be worth with some 
change of four lots that might happen at some point in a speculative rezoning and a speculative subdivision process, but it didn't do the math. There was no math, and she pointed to no shred of evidence in the record to contradict the math that we showed that the buildings should be torn down. What happened on Marquia is utterly irrelevant. Mr. Jenkins uh, offered, again, no evidence about economic. All he basically said was, you shouldn't have bought it in the first place, and now you're trying to make a windfall off of it. Again, that doesn't, it's not true, first of all. And second, it shows that um, there's no evidence in the record. Everything he referenced was irrelevant. Now, I, I want to just take a couple of seconds, and, and Mr. Hyde's probably looking at me a little jealously as if I got $750,000 in legal fees uh, for this. Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, we have not spent $750,000 on legal fees or the book. Uh, that's simply a made-up number. Uh, if you take a zero off of the legal fees between me, my predecessor, and uh, put some engineering on there, you might be closer. Uh, but the 750 to a million dollars in legal fees and engineering fees is, uh, I have a word here that I wanted to use, but I won't. Um, and his statement that we're trying to sell the property for $10 million as is equally as uh, fictitious as everything else that he said. Uh, his argument about what the buildings might be done, what happened to them once they're torn down, um, is also utterly irrelevant to the question before you, so I won't bother to deal with it. Um, I didn't catch the name of the gentleman from the Utah Preservation Society, uh, but uh, basically his only point was the tax credits were ignored. No, they weren't ignored. We specifically, in detail, at the request of the panel the first time, addressed the tax credit issue, and we showed that even if you got the tax credits, and even if you had income available to offset against the tax credits, it would be massive amounts of income. I think my number that I did the basic math on was you would need to make, IRS, IRES would need to make $5.6 million per year to utilize the full value of those tax credits. There's no possible way that IRES makes $5.6 million per year in profit. The tax credits help. There's no question the tax credits get you off the ground, but that's like trying to get a 747 off the ground with one engine. It doesn't fly, and there's no math in the record that shows that it flies. The simple fact is, on all six of these buildings, and I do credit the, the Preservation Utah gentleman for being candid enough to acknowledge that the six buildings should stay, should be knocked down, and the panel should be sustained. As to the other four, I will repeat again, there is not a shred of evidence supporting the decision based off of the illegal, ambiguous, unintelligible standards as administered by the biased and unqualified um, person on the panel, Mr. Francis. Uh, and because of those, the facts are clear on the math and that big book, we would ask you to sustain the panel's decision on the six and overturn the panel's decision on the four, but I have no illusions that I'm gonna get seven votes to do the latter. Are there other questions for the applicant? Go ahead. Yes, Ms. Stoll. Hi, could you um, address the comment about what was done to the property after um, it was purchased? Yeah, first of all, that's not relevant to this panel. You weren't here the last time. There were, this is the, the hardship is the seventh criteria out of, out of seven. The, the question of supposedly uh, intentional neglect was addressed by this panel uh, originally, and it's not, a pan, it's not a factor in terms of hardship. 
but it also is untrue. Uh, the massive demolition that was claimed and the neglect that was claimed is just not the case. The, these buildings are to a point where they cannot be rehabilitated. They have been uh, investigated to determine whether they are functional. Investigating you need to take down some of the interior materials, but that that's not an issue because you have to take them down to restore the building anyway. The, the analysis this is, 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 excuse me, the analysis is simply put, almost nothing can be restored from these buildings. To restore their, uh, to, excuse me, to retain their historicity, you would essentially have to take them apart with a toothpick, store those shreds of materials that were reusable, rebuild the buildings in their entirety with new foundations and make them comply with code. And even then they wouldn't be historic because the historic condition of these buildings from the, from the 19, early 1900s was as brown clapboard. All of the gingerbread on there was added later. It was not part of the historic buildings. To the extent that these were historic worker housing, they were historic worker housing. Some of them were transported actually from off-site apparently, but they were transported in brown clapboard. The city's own photographs show in the original report, the thing we fought about first that's been sued about that's not relevant to the hardship panel, shows them with people standing up in front of them uh, on their horse and buggy and their brown, brown clapboard. So the demolition, the intentional neglect is not relevant and was not true. Other questions for the applicant? Yeah, I guess one question. Um, so of the four, uh, uh, buildings that uh, have been found to, uh, to to not meet the criteria for demolition. Right. Um, can you just quickly review the restoration costs and, and the estimated uh, values of those homes if they were to be resold? Fortunately, Mr. Brennan, that's why I have Mr. Breen here because uh, I, I, I'm not the expert in that. And Adam, do you have? We can go through it in general. I think just in general, just yeah. As a, I think we've, we, you know, we've talked about the math quite a bit, and I think it would yeah. be helpful to have the math. You know, that that uh, makes shared. perfectly good sense, and and it and it's actually fairly well detailed, uh, in the in the materials that we submitted. But we'll try, uh, we'll try to have Mr. Breen summarize it. This is Adam Breen, who was yeah, Adam Breen, Breen Homes. Uh, general contractor brought on to help Don through the process here. Uh, maybe you can give me a repeat of your question and I'll see what I can help answer for you. So again, I just I, um, don't need to go to through all of the detail of how uh, of the estimates, but but uh, an estimate of, uh, you know, of, of uh, investment uh, rehabilitation of the four buildings um, uh, that were uh, did not meet the, the demolition criteria. And then what is the estimated value of those homes? Uh, uh, it may take end? us a few a few minutes to get that, Mr. Brennan, because we weren't necessarily anticipating that in, in individually. It, well, while you're doing that, Mr. Breen is at the microphone. Could you ex tell us about your experience with uh, historical restorations? Yeah, so my, my uh, experience within res historical restorations has, has been very much in the Sugar House, uh, Harvard, Yale area. Um, I, I primarily build custom homes for a living. Uh, it's uh, about three to five custom homes in Phil East Bench, Salt Lake. Uh, it is primarily my focus for Breen Homes. Outside of that, I do a fair amount of investing with a, a real estate development team uh, in the remodel and rehab area, like I said, within the, the Harvard Yale area. Uh, currently, we have one on 1484 East Harvard Avenue. Uh, we have a, another one that's not in historic, but being his, being remodeled in the historic fashion up on uh, Sheridan Avenue. I believe it is a 2010 East Sheridan Avenue. I've done uh, a couple of restorations up on the 17th East area of Princeton. I've uh, done a couple more down in, in the Harvard, a little further west from 15th on the Harvard as well. Um, so I'm familiar with the historic restoration uh, and, and what it takes to get there. Sure. Have, have any of those projects um, secured state or federal rehabilitation? Uh, not that I've personally done myself. I know clients, once I've been done with them, have pushed for that. I'm not familiar if they've actually gotten to that or not yet. 
And when it comes to value of question, uh, I, I actually would fall back to a real estate expert on that. I'd consider myself more of a general contractor. Um, so if, if that's something we want to bring John up for. Mr. Brennan, we had, a, uh, we had an appraisal uh, on each of these buildings, and I don't know if I can find the appraisals instantaneously. Uh, the, the, the general, we've got a spreadsheet. We're, we're trying to find the spreadsheet which had uh, all of them on it. Is that it? I don't know. I apologize for not having this at the tip of my fingers, Mr. Brennan. Oh, this is it, you. Here it is. Let's look at it. That's it. There you go. The values are in there for the appraisals. Yeah, there's a, uh, it's, this is exhibit U. Yep. Okay. There's an exhibit U in the big book. Uh, and let's see which one's the, the 432 is uh, acquisition and expenses to date was, a, was approximately a quarter of a million dollars. The uh, site work is oh yeah that 432 that that's that's the bigger one 432 sorry we we've we've done this so many times we're we're used to the nomenclature of 432 the duplex and the yellow house. Uh, so 432 is uh, was acquisition and expenses to date of about a quarter of a million. Uh, the cost to rehab it, uh, including the site work, the A and E fees, the unit rehab, uh, are, within, are approximately a million dollars. The financing on that's approximately over time would be about 75 we estimated the total rehab costs were about a million two four that so therefore the total price of the property is approximately a million three six um, we estimated there might be some tax credits available uh, of a million dollars worth of the rehab the reappraisal we had it appraised at, at, at what we thought it was worth it was four hundred and sixty five thousand dollars the credits are one hundred and ninety seven thousand dollars yeah, the marketing of 46.5, which means a net proceeds of sale of $418,000 for a net loss or gain of approximately three quarters of a million dollars, Mr. Brennan. Ballpark. The, du du the, the, the duplexes, the total, and I'm going to just add these in my head, and uh, pardon me, I'm going to be ballparking. There's, they're about uh, yeah, 250 uh, for acquisition costs again. The uh, site costs uh, about 80. The uh, soft costs another total. So the soft cost total added cost to the rehab, it's 295. Uh, rehab the financing costs are another 23,000. The rehab cost total for the two of them put together is approximately 720 thousand uh, dollars. You add the land costs that makes it approximately. Uh, $950,000, of which approximately 600 is subject to tax credits. The reappraisal for the pair of them is a, is a half a million dollars. When you take off the, uh, when you add the credits, you get about 60,000 back. The sales and marketing at 10%, uh, so that's 50,000 total. The ballpark net sales proceeds is about 450, uh, which leads you to a net loss on the two prop on the duplex of ballpark uh, $400,000 on the duplex. Which one's the yellow house? That is 258. 258, uh, thank you. 258 is uh, acquisition expenses to date about 155,000. Uh, site work, uh, this is one that's more expensive because there's no, you've got to fix the foundation. Um, the, uh, there's 5,000 5, in A&E fees. Uh, rehab is another th ballpark three hundred thousand uh, dollars. You put in some financing costs. Uh, your total rehab costs two fifty eight. Your total costs are approximately four hundred and seventy thousand uh, for the work on it. When you add the uh, value of the land, it's six hundred and twenty that you're in it. 
of which 327 would be subject to tax credits. Uh, it was appraised at about approximately 250. Uh, if it was rehab, the tax credits would be, add 62,000 for that. Sales and marketing take it off it would be a quarter. It would be 25. The net sale proceeds are about 225, leading to a net loss on the property of about 332 thousand dollars. Is that close enough, Mr. Brennan? And again, I apologize. I didn't. I, I knew it was on a spreadsheet. I just couldn't remember which one. And that information was all presented. I mean, the reason I brought this up, quite honestly, is we're talking about economic hardship. And, yes, sir. And this is the first time that we've actually talked about the economics. Yes, sir. So I, I felt like it was important. It, it's it's it, absolutely, sir. And I apologize for for not. I mean, it, it was in there. And and I can tell you this: those numbers were presented to the panel, and were not rebutted in any way. No one submitted any contradictory evidence at all. Who generated those numbers? We generated them with a, a licensed. Uh, Did you take like a consensus of several valuations? Or no, is we're, 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 uh, our burden is to put in what we believe the evidence would be and put it in honestly and in good faith. That's exactly what we did. The panel asked us to go back and do a tax credit evaluation. We went back, we talked to a tax accountant. Uh, we originally didn't think there were tax credits available based on uh, some statements that had been made to Mr. Armstrong earlier in the process. When it turned out that there might be tax credits, we immediately went out and took a look at tax credits and we evaluated that evidence, fairly presented it to the commission. Uh, to the panel and showed that it didn't make any difference. But no, we did not, to be clear, we did not go out and try to disprove our hardship case. How would, how would you characterize the um, projected level of quality of the completed renovations um, as, as laid out in the uh, breakout cost estimates? And I'll kind of pick the easy target mm. of granite countertops. Right. Is that sort of the level of finish that you ex your expectations throughout the uh, project? I mean, when, when dealing with a historic rehabilitation, you've got to kind of hit a historic level that you're, that most clientele are going to look for when doing something like that. For example, we, we may be looking more at a wall plaster as opposed to drywall. Uh, so something like that, we may be looking at a, a nicer granite that can get a, a higher price for a small square footage. Uh, in the particular okay. area, so yeah, they're they're going to be a nicer finish for sure. So they were they were higher end, definitely for the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say higher end. If we're talking on a, in a value scale from from one to ten, we weren't pushing twelve. You know, we were pushing in the seven and eight range. Uh, okay. if, if that helps value, okay. maybe some of that area. And I'm kind of curious. Um, when were these numbers generated and last updated? These numbers were generated and last updated. I'm trying to remember when the last time we did it was about. Five months ago, six Something months ago, like so that. early year. And that was really, if you if you want to talk uh, of the cost, that was prior to uh, the lumber increase we're seeing right now, the tariffs we're seeing in steel, the increase in cedar, copper. I mean, we can all say that's gone up insanely. Okay. I mean, because one of the one of the numbers that sort of jumped out at me, <clears throat> partly um, because it's uh, less than my daughter pays for a, a poor apartment near Trolley Square, was the uh, monthly rental rate of a dollar ten. So today I, I contacted a friend of mine, dollar ten per square foot per month. Oh, I'm sorry, a buck. Sorry, you, a buck, t uh, sorry. buck ten. Uh, <laughs> and so I contacted a friend today, a, a friend of mine today, um, who manages a great number of apartments throughout the Intermountain West. Had him run a report uh, through a data service I think called CoStar, and within a half mile of this address th on Third West, the uh, range. <clears throat> This was at the at the absolute bottom end of the current market, and it almost doubled from that amount. Admittedly, how that translates down through the dollars is is something else that needs to happen. Uh, I'm familiar with several of those projects that you're probably referring to, and most of those are heavily amenitized. Uh, they're all modern. I mean, I'm familiar with the one on that's almost certainly the one you're talking about at the high end, the double price. That's probably uh, on Fourth West, uh, the new project on Fourth West at about, I think that's about two, uh, it's about 225 a foot. Uh, those are ultra modern uh, with a gymnasium, a pool, uh, underground parking, uh, et cetera. I think you're looking at apples and oranges, Mr. Shepard. Well, 
I also went to Zillow at the same time, right across the street from this, uh, from Bishop's place today, <clears throat> there's a house probably 85 years old. The interior photos were nice. It did not have granite countertops, though it was not that nice. Um, currently offered at uh, 15.25 a month. Um, rent per square foot, <clears throat> excuse me, rent per square foot, dollar twenty nine, yeah. for an unrenovated house. When your projection is granite and a seven eight out of a ten scale. And how big is that property? That property is eleven hundred square feet, twelve hundred square feet, which is right in your ballpark. No, well, it's actually bigger, but that's somewhat, okay. somewhat bigger. And I, I think they're safe to say that rents have increased in the last six seven months in in the area with the the growth rate. So rents yeah, and costs. Kind of, kind of I, I think not, I think you'd be safe yeah. to say that. The, you, the you problem, Mr. Shepard, is we've always had this, and 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 Mr. Francis tried to bring this up as well. Well, all of your stuff is old. Well, it wasn't our. F we we can't do an updated set of data every time we get postponed uh, another month for for hearings. Uh, we we gave the data the best we could at the time. I mean, it wasn't my fault that Mr. Francis rejected Scott Sabe and rejected uh, Chris McCandless and wasted 30 days while we did that to try to come up with a qualified member of the panel. Uh, it's not my fault, it was not our fault that we had difficulty getting panel members to hearings. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not faulting them. I mean, it's, it's busy schedules. It just happens. And time flows inexorably. And we dipped our toe in the moving river and at the time we could, uh, and we updated it as we needed to, and our data is as good as it could reasonably be. And you could quibble with it, but nobody did below. Yeah. Um, Mr. Breen, what, what kind of average or high and low dollar per square foot rehab costs have you had? And I, th I think one thing we need to maybe back up from sure. is the definition before the definition of rehab and restoration, because yeah. the descriptions, I think, of, of carefully dismantling with a toothpick the historic buildings and numbering all the pieces and reestablishing and rebuilding is a museum quality restoration that you're talking about. And the tax credits and the standards that this commission uses are rehabilitation which is recognizing that a historic building has many deficiencies and consequently has to be adapted and um, brought up to code and made responsive to modern needs and that those changes are compatible, not necessarily restorative. Sure. So I'm kind of curious about what kind of range you Are you talking on a with. historic level or just a rehabil rehabilitation level? Well, I think we ought to talk rehabilitation because mm -hmm. that's what these, this really should be about, not restoration. If I'm, if I'm speaking candid and saying lipstick on a pig, uh, I, I don't see anything less expensive of, of, let's say, paint, carpet, you know, some flooring uh, of around 40 maybe $45 a square foot. Um, on a high end, uh, we've pushed just under 500 a foot on full restoration, historic rehab, remodel. Uh, none of those, I will say some of those have included adding on square footage. None of those have, com have included completely removing a house, redoing a foundation, uh, and trying to work around uh, a complete removal of the property, property so to speak. Mm -hmm. I, and that's, again, that's, that's being very candid of, it, it, it comes to what you pick and put in. I mean, they, they can be, you can, the level of de detail you take into these can, can vary incredibly. I'm confused somewhat, Mr. Shepard, and the reason I'm confused somewhat is because the standards are virtually unarticul un unintelligible in this point. What you're saying is we should be using uh, as a replacement cost uh, a faux or a facsimile no, rest that's restoration? That's not what I said. Okay. I just want, I'm just trying to understand it. I mean, what's the level between toothpick by toothpick and rehabilitation? Uh, but it doesn't really matter because these buildings are structurally unsound. You would have to tear them down and put something new back up. The evidence from the structural engineer is that they cannot be rehabilitated. That's undisputed evidence. Well, undisputed that it can't be. Look, I said that anything can be done as long as you're willing to spend enough money on it. The question is, are we willing to spend enough money on it? And there's no evidence that they can be economically rehabilitated. Zero. Yeah, so I think, I think we need to, you need, 
to stay there. I think the issue is, you know, even in um, Mr. Condor's report, December of 2017, um, realistically, both options are very difficult to do without almost completely rebuilding or lifting the structures. Previous statements are you could find no one no engineer would give you any information about lifting a structure. No, no, that's not what I said. No, I said no, I said, that's not what I said. What I said is no engineer would sign off on them for structural repair. I was very careful about that. And Mr. Condor wouldn't do that, yet he stated it in his report that uh, lifting uh, structures. Uh, Mr. Shepard, I'm just not going to argue with you. There's no point. Uh, or respond, I suppose. Um, I'm sorry? I said, or respond, because I think Mr. Condor's report and the other structural report also clearly state that they are opinions and everything's an opinion Mr. Absolutely. Shepherd other than gravity and that the ability of these buildings to be renovated I think is there what's that it depends on who you are Mr. Richards. it depends on where you are the gravity on Mars is different than the gravity on Jupiter absolutely true but we're here on earth and in on earth there's absolutely no evidence that these buildings can be re economically rehabilitated. There's zero evidence in the record to that effect. Zero. Yeah. Other questions for the applicant or his uh, contractor? If not, thank you very much. Um, Executive session, or do we a, a brief break? You guys good? Want to keep going? Okay. We'll enter into executive session, and um, again, just to kind of refocus, we have the tasks in front of us are reviewing the results, the findings of the economic hardship panel. Um, our decisions have to either be consistent with their findings or we have the three-quarter vote of the quorum that uh, the economic review panel either acted arbitrarily or based its report on an erroneous, let's see, the material was in there somewhere you wanted to add. An erroneous finding of a material, material fact. fact. Material should be at the end. So Yes. Now, um, let me just add one thing uh, on what I said earlier. Um, if we get to that point where um, you have a, a three-quarters vote uh, to depart from the findings of the economic hardship panel, then you're going to need to go into that analysis um, in the ordinance of specifically okay. did this meet each of these standards. Thank you. Yeah, so Charles, that, Charles yeah. I have a question of curiosity. You um, Tell us more about your rent survey. I'm sorry, say again. Tell us more about your rent survey. I... The, the uh, analysis that he did quickly, just with this one data service. Um, Mr. So Chairman. Yes. I got to warn you, you're making yourself a witness here. By, by introducing evidence that's right. outside of the record. Correct. All right. Okay, well. There are services that provide that information. How's that? <laughs> right, and I think it's well, well, uh, known that the smaller a unit is, the higher the square foot rent is. That's public knowledge. Right. And and also we need to recognize that the there's not a there's a disincentive of economy of non scale here as well. I mean the small buildings they they are difficult to rehab or easy to rehab, but they're smaller. There's not there's not the economy of scale. <laughs> Other comments? <clears throat> I'm, I'm maybe going to go off uh, the deep end here in a, a few ways. Um, you know, I think that I find it um, interesting that we had a project brought to the Historic Landmark Commission within the last few months of a building that the chief building official for Salt Lake City um, found was not a uh, in imminent uh, threat of collapse, and yet the roof had collapsed uh, on 7th East, uh, for those that will remember that one. Um, I'm 
I'm frustrated that uh, the RDA uh, was involved in a project uh, uh, to this extent and did not do their due diligence to protect the, uh, to, to frankly avoid putting this commission in this position, um, that, that they did not put in the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the precautions that if the developer weren't able to do that, to, to do what he had intended on doing, that the, uh, you know, the, the sale would have returned or the sale would not have gone through. Um, you know, and, and quite honestly, I guess I'm, I'm frustrated that, uh, you know, uh, that, that, the, that I'm not hearing that, uh, you know, I find it kind of insane that uh, 432 North 300 West uh, rehabilitation costs and sales costs are a million dollars. That does not seem, sound rational to me. Um, although many of any, any examples that I could cite uh, are irrelevant um, uh, to the, the matter in front of us. Clearly, many people choose to uh, rehabilitate uh, older structures, uh, pre-1960s, pre-seismic design, um, uh, and, and yet they do, and, uh, and they, they seem to, you know, fare fairly well. One of our uh, commissioner members uh, makes a living at it. Um, that is, and so I do think that um, we sh need to perhaps hold ourselves a little bit accountable in not having, uh, you know, had the uh, uh, economic hardship uh, uh, representatives be more grounded in um, the economics and, and you know, discuss uh, or, or go to greater task on that. Um, but anyway, I just, I just felt, uh, I feel compelled. I, I am concerned uh, that uh, we do have a number of structures here in an older neighborhood that uh, would be just about any neighborhood. And, you know, any home that is older than 60 years would not survive um, an economic hardship analysis uh, taken in this rain. Also, um, they're, you know, while they need to be safe and habitable, um, you know, they're not a change of use. Uh, you know, they, they, many of the conditions, while they may be unsafe, I would think that they could be, you know, some of the issues are grandfathered in, in terms of non-compliance with current code. And I, I think that's a little um, incorrect. I live in unreinforced masonry home, although I've made several with a sandstone foundation um, I've made several investments into it, and I think many people have. And again, I know it's irrelevant to the uh, matter in front of us. But um, you know, those were those improvements that I took uh, made to my home uh, are entirely voluntary. Um, you know, they were not uh, they are not required by building code. I could remodel my kitchen and not have to do a seismic upgrade. Other, other comments, anyone? Or a motion? I'd really like, Paul offered some um, insight earlier into, um, you know, just some areas of liability and how we should be proceed with caution while deliberating. And I have a lot of thoughts right now and a lot of <laughs> conclusions that I could draw. I would really appreciate some clarity from your vantage point. So yeah, I, the, the word of caution was not as to anything specific. It's just that when we're dealing with um, a, a typical land use case, um, the the consequence of a decision that's contrary to law is that uh, you go to an appeal hearing officer, you go to court, and they, they send it back and say, do it over. Um, when you're talking about the potential for a regulatory taking, there's money involved. Um, the city, in, in a recent case, um, and that wasn't a regulatory, it was an actual taking, but there were some consequences uh, that we hadn't foreseen would be as uh, significant. 
Um, so th that that was just my, it was sort of a general caution, not anything specific. Happy to, <laughs> I'm happy to ask, answer specific questions if, if there's something you're concerned about and if you want to do that in a, a, a less public setting, um, we can go through the process of. You could take a break if you'd like. Well, we would need to go into a closed session to discuss that, uh, that kind of a thing, if you felt that was appropriate or necessary. Um, from my two cents, I, I have a few things that I'm thinking that I don't want to verbalize on the record in a place that could lend exposure, but I w would like to check them with someone who knows legally what to do to make sure that I'm considering things in a way that's consistent with code, precedent, and what I'm supposed, the scope of what I'm supposed to be considering. Hmm. What are your recommendations on a, on a closed session at this point? Uh, so you, in order to do that, you or have the to process, state the purpose. Rather, you have to have two thirds of the members vote for that specific purpose. I'm not, um, Deb, have you done closed meetings before? We have to be able to record it. Right, we have to record it in a separate way. Do you have the recording equipment? Right, so. Um, I suppose another option you know is just to see if, if the... If, if, you want, if you want to take a quick break, maybe I can address it with Victoria specifically. Um, I'm, I'm fine with a quick break, okay. if, that, if that seems appropriate. I, I don't to... think we're running afoul of the Open Public Meetings Act. Bruce. Mr. Shepard, it makes a difference. All right, let's do that then. Let's take a, let's take a quick break. Okay, five minute, five minute break. Okay, a little bit more than five minute break. Um, one discussion, sidebar discussion that we've had today is that we don't have necessarily in this staff report a suggested motion. And I know we've had some discussion earlier during the week offline about bulk motions on, on these groups of buildings, if that's in, case, in fact what we want to do, the commission wants to do. Um, Paul or Amy, could you address recommendations on that front? Um, yeah, if you want to go through the tedium of voting uh, one by one, uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, you can vote to adopt the findings of the economic hardship panel, which covers all of the properties. Um, even though I know we have several different application numbers. Um, I, I, that would be sufficient. Um, as far as a, a motion, I think that we would, um, we would just follow the same format that we typically do on adopting a uh, staff recommendation okay. in a, a staff report. Okay. Um, That's what seemed like makes sense. Okay, well, let's, um, we're still in executive session. Um, Following a sugar and hydration break, are there other um, other comments that we wanted to uh, share with the commission? Other questions we wanted to ask or observations amongst ourselves? Yeah, this 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 isn't going to reach any conclusion here, but it's a, it's a challenging issue. Uh, I don't think things are quite as clear as the applicant m claims they are. I'm 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 troubled and that there's no question that restoring, re rehabilitating these structures is, ex is expensive. Uh, that said, I, I'm not, not completely convinced of the validity of their cost estimates. I would really like to have seen something uh, independently produced, and this is not the fault of the applicant for not producing that. They're perfectly in the right to produce what they wish. It would, would have been helpful to see something to give it some balance. When we put a project out for bid, we endeavor to get two or three different bids on it from various contractors. So can, can, I, can I address that for a second? Um, Mr. Baird indicated that there was no evidence to the contrary. 
um, to to suggest that um, or to, to call into question what they submitted. Um, this is really a unilateral type of proceeding. It's not your typical um, developer presents one side, the neighbors present the other. Uh, I think it would be unreasonable to expect uh, Ms. Cromer or Mr. Shear to commission uh, a structural engineer to do an analysis of what's going on on property that they don't own. Um, and, and by the same token, uh, it would be unreasonable for the city to incur the expense of preparing um, an analysis that, similar to what you're describing. So uh, you, you, to some extent, have to take the information for what it is. Um, you are entitled to determine if you believe that that information is wrong. Um, the bottom line is that if you disagree with anything that the economic hardship panel uh, concluded, then you're going to have to identify specifically what those uh, erroneous uh, findings of material fact were. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. That makes sense. Doesn't make it any any easier. I know for it us doesn't. Too. I know this is a different animal. Uh, also, this this next comment is in the realm of being unfactual, but it's just the gut feeling is that. The applicant doesn't, to me, have seemed to have made a good faith effort to make this thing work. And we can't really, we can't really judge on that, but that's just been the gut feeling as we've met a couple of times. And I, I, there are no facts here to, to base a decision on, but I just wanted to, to say that's the way the, the applicant uh, comes across. And I'm having a hard time setting that apart to try to stick to the facts. I'm just expressing general, general emotions here of why this is a troubling and challenging uh, decision to come to. Yeah. Ken, can I ask a sincere question? What do you mean they haven't attempted to make it work? You mean they haven't attempted to renovate it or they haven't attempted to, you don't think they've presented their, they've made their effort in good faith to show why it should be demolished? What do you mean by they haven't made it good, work? Good question, Robert. Uh, I go back to the RDA process. And at that point, there were some pretty savvy people working on putting together a concept for how this could be purchased and the land developed through a renovation process. And they went through a mathematical and economic analysis that appeared to show that you could buy this, restore it, and make a profit. And how that fell apart and how things changed and how yeah. for some years went by and we're at a position now where, yeah, costs are way up. And I, I, I completely agree with the applicant that at today's cost, it is going to be a challenge to do anything. But how did we get here? You know, uh, there were a bunch of people who made a bunch of mistakes or, uh, you know, I, I, I don't quite understand what happened four years ago. That's that like they, 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 did the, uh, they did what you said in order to get the loan. You'd have to show that or you wouldn't get the loan. But then everything died for a few years and now we're in a position where it's not economically viable anymore if it was then. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Discretion. Are there other other comments, other discussion topics, other points to make, or motions that anyone wishes to make? Someone needs to make a motion at some point. I want to point out maybe the obvious, but. It looks like the findings on 432 North, 300 West, 265, 267 Bishop Place, and 248 Bishop Place, the findings are really detailed and they look pretty solid. So I don't think we're having any issue there. Um, 
And I guess what troubles me a little bit more is that we don't have the same level of detail on findings regarding the other six. So that's where, that's where I have some difficulties in evaluating it. Yeah, I would, I would agree. There's, there's simple statements there that don't give us that detail. So based upon that, is, the, is there some interest in revisiting those six? Well, that's, that's what I'm thinking, because I'm thinking the other three look really solid. And it, it's hard to argue with them, and they're, they're very thorough in the findings. But the other six is um, there's not very much in terms of findings at all, really. It's right. the challenge, of so, course. Is, the challenge, of course, is as Paul's pointed out, um, to do anything other than the um, findings uh, to find a to find. However, to word it. To, to revisit these requires notice or definition of specific uh, deficiencies in the analysis, if deficiencies is a good enough term there, um, that they did. And that's, I think that's a, while I don't disagree, I, th I think we're all, all concerned about those, the, um, some of the various numbers that, uh, you know, well, I mean, high I construction look at, costs and, and you look other at page assumptions. 11. And it says, um, say again, where are you? 11. <laughs> yeah, staff memo, report of economic hardship. So I'm just looking at the actual findings made by the panel. And if you look on page 11, it says, um, the engineering report did not thoroughly address the suitability for rehabilitation. Um, information has not been provided related to a reuse, new construction plan for the properties. The evidence provided is for demolition. So it just seems like there's an absence of evidence. No information has been provided regarding marketability of the property for sale or lease within the previous two years. I mean, there's just a real absence in terms of findings. So, so Charles, I, I guess I'd like to, I'm not in a rush to get out of here, but I am interested in kind of moving along here and, and uh, maybe I can start at a global level and, and just ask, uh, it seems to me like, or just say, it seems to me that uh, the process has taken this uh, to, a, to a, a panel created by law and, and They've spent a lot of time on this and made a decision that three three could three should stay and six could be demolished and and I just wonder um, it seems to me like there ought to be something pretty compelling for us to step in and second guess this panel i mean that's their purpose is to go into a, a deeper dive than us and to and and to uh, and to figure out how this ought to go. And so, you know, I'm inclined to support what they did in both directions, and, and uh, that's a motion I would make if, if people want to go that way. But uh, otherwise, we, we're just starting over, aren't we, and revisiting what they did and, and uh, substituting our judgment for theirs and, and making these nine decisions again. But, but what findings did you find persuasive with regard to the six properties? Well, that's why I, I, I'm talking, Shelley, at a pretty high level here where I'm not going to sit and, and, and go through every detail of, of all nine of them, you know, from a global standpoint. They've got to give us something, though. It's, it pretty, is, it's pretty subjective. It, this isn't about persuasive. It's about whether you find that they acted in ar an arbitrary manner or How can we that their findings that? were that they, the report was based on an erroneous, erroneous finding of a material fact. But their report is so limited concerning their findings regarding the six properties. How do we give meaningful analysis to that? Well, identify what, um, identify how that was done in an arbitrary manner or that. If there are no findings, you can't determine anything. The findings are really good on the last three. They're excellent <laughs> and they're detailed. They're easy to follow. The findings on the first six are, are not very good at all. 
Well, but on three of them, you're finding, Shelley, that you're going to keep them up. So you're, you know, there's grounds for, you know, reno they didn't find grounds to keep the others and renovate them. And so there's not much to say except I've looked at all this and I don't, I find that it's not worth keep. I mean, they have to make some findings. They have to say, you know, we found that that the the six, the six properties could not be rehabilitated based on X or Y. I mean, the, the findings are deficient. Mm -hmm. Well, they're adequate for me. You know, they're they're making a decision in their mind whether these different standards that they go through have been met and. Uh, I guess you could always argue about how much level of detail where people explain how they're voting or why they're voting. Um, we listen to all these facts and we go through everything and then we make decisions and we don't, you know, and I know they're supposed to lay out their findings, but I just don't we see could any. disagree on the level of detail. The only finding they have is there may be value in the property, but that cannot be realized until the property is sold. There is no current income. That's a finding. But the other findings are there's no information, we're not sure about this, you know? That's what I'm troubled by. Well, maybe one or the other of you should uh, make a motion or proceed on that, and let's see where we take it. Uh, Paul, is it an option to ask the panel to provide more detailed findings regarding the six properties? They've, they've concluded. Well, I mean, like if it was a court, you could certainly remand for more detailed findings. Are we not able to? No. I'm going to make a motion, uh, and this is with regard to 342 North 300 West, 248 West Bishop Place, and the duplex 265-267 West Bishop Place. They're all HLC 2017 numbers, specifically number 30, number 20, and number 29. I move that we support the findings of the Economic Hardship Panel. We have a motion to approve. Uh, to support the findings on the second of the two um, reviews in conjunction with those three. Are can, there can you state the basis for that? I mean, you can. It, it's as simple as uh, the, for the reasons the, based in there. The reasons based in the economic hardship, uh, okay. the summary of the economic hardship report. Thanks. Okay, we have a motion. I second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? No discussion. Let's vote. Uh, hmm. Rachel. Uh, yes. Harding, yes. Victoria, yes. Richardson, I. Stoll, yes. Peters, yes. Brennan, yes. Hyde, no. Okay. So <laughs> that uh, motion passes. Let's see. Well, or does it? Well, we, we agree with the commission. We agree um, with the findings. The panel. Yes. So it's just, well, let's see. It's he had seven <laughs> votes. <laughs> You had your 75 percent on that, right? We did. Well, we yeah, and we didn't need, uh, and we didn't need. We only needed a majority on that one because we were. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. Yes. Oh, you only need that if you're overturning it. So right. you're good. That was the easy. Yeah, three. two of them. Two of them would have done yeah. it. Okay. So now we need to um, consider the the six that were found um, that the commission, the panel, found economic hardship based on their specific findings, and maybe maybe it's worth reading those findings, I don't know, just out loud, just to consider there's only one, two, three, four, five of I them. I just read them. Yeah. I read them read all. Read all of them? Uh -huh. Well, oh. except for the first one. Um, the first finding was um, that the applicant had knowledge of the landmark designation at the time of acquisition. So that was the first finding. And then there was the finding I pointed out that was kind of the only meaningful finding, which was there may be value in the property, but that cannot be realized until the property is sold. There's no current income. Well, that's a helpful finding. 
But then the next finding is no information has been provided regarding the marketability of the property for sale or lease within the previous two, two years. years. And I think that's an important finding. You know, I think that information would be very helpful. Mr. Mr. Oh, Chair. Just a moment, please. Can, can I read the, that standard? It says the marketability of the property for sale or lease considered in relation to any listing of the property for sale or lease and price asked and offers received, if any, within the previous two years. So, and then it lists, this can include testimony and relevant documents regarding any real estate broker or firm engaged to sell or lease the property, reasonableness of the price or rent sought by the applicant, and any advertisements placed for the sale or rent of the property. If that stuff doesn't exist, okay. then well, you couldn't find okay. a, it. And I think that's what their finding was. Okay. No information. Um. Well, then the next finding, though. Mm -hmm. The engineering yes. report did not thoroughly address the suitability for rehabilitation, and that's sort of key. Certainly, I certainly agree. I mean, it, otherwise, it seems like they should be finding that, the finding should state that, the en that they were convinced by the engineering report submitted. Right. That's what I'm saying so, about the findings. Yeah. So it's, it's opposite of what seems to support their summary finding. Let's see. Ability of alternative uses. So Again, I think, you know, while their, while their statement, well, I don't know, I'll just, I'll say this anyways, you know, their, their finding, never mind. <laughs> so, so I can read. Not thoroughly. Yeah. I don't know, I don't have a, a great suggestion. What others, thoughts from other commissioners about the, the six properties? The last line of the finding that Shelley pointed out says that the report only addressed demolition. I think that's problematic. Again, I don't, Paul, I'd appreciate some guidance if, I understand they don't have to go and get multiple bids and do an RFP kind of thing, but if we're doing economic, is that something rational to have expected? Amy, can, can you can you explain um, or recall why they came to this finding, why they came to this conclusion on those standards? I think their their findings and conclusions were largely based on um, number four, or I guess it would be D, which was the engineering report. They did rely heavily on that. Um, they also s seemed to separate the structures by whether or not um, they had a foundation, and so the three that they ch said had um, did not have a hardship, those have foundations, and the the six that they said um, did have a hardship, those do not have foundations. So they didn't have a lot of information on the other standards as it, it says in the findings. Um, but it was largely based on the engineering report. That is, um, from my recollection, what they uh, used to base their conclusion and findings on. We're just taking a look at the, the transcript here. I'm not sure the summaries. Amy, can you describe how, you know, up above in the first main block, we have each of their votes and they make, they make a statement about sort of a general summary statement. How were the finding statements developed? So 
Who actually crafted these words? So these are based on the verbatim minutes that are included in the report. Um, when they each went and voted, th that's exactly what they said. Um, up, up, at the, up at the vote area, but the actual statement here yes. that says findings, yes. findings, findings. And then during their discussion on these particular structures, um, those were the findings that were made. Um, some of them had, I, I can't remember if we separated out who said what, but there we also included the dissenting opinion as well in some of the findings. So because it was a two-third vote mm -hmm. on both of the groupings, we did include both opinions on those. So the finding, the finding statements, the one, two, three, four, five finding statements, are. I'm still confused. Are they, are they, um, city summary of the main statements, and then those were those were put in print, and the three uh, panelists then said yes, I agree with those, and and or no, I I just don't disagree. All right. Yeah, so we, we summarized them based on the verbatim minutes that were done, okay. and then this report was sent to the review panel, and each of them signed. There, okay. Well, since there's a lot of silence here, I, I will put forth a motion to move us one way or another. I move that in the case of PLNHLC 2017, 0017, 0016, 0019, 0024, 0025, 0026, that we support the findings of the Economic Hardship Panel. Okay. and, and I'll second that. We need a, a, any additional statement on that based on the findings or whatever? And based on the findings Thank you. Uh, well. within. Yeah, those review panel findings. Okay. And there's been, it's been a motion. Second. Okay. It's any uh, question or discussion? If not, let's vote. Let's start from the right just for differences. Robert. Uh, I vote yes. Tom? I vote yes. Peters, yes. Stoll, yes. Richardson opposed. Victoria, no. Harding, no. Quist, no. So it's a tie. Uh, it, you, need, you need seven. Seven. You need seven. Move that out of the way. Agree. Agree. Just to agree with the findings. Right. What I'm saying is, if you would need seven opposed. Right. Um, yeah. No, you, you, but not, you're not voting for something else. You're just not voting for this. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the motion is tied. Is this okay? <laughs> we have a so we have a tie. We have a tie. Break it. So I have a vote. Oh, Wait a second. I didn't really vote. Um, yeah. Well, let me let me ask before you do that, Paul. I, I don't if, know if we can right now. Not, not, I, not I, I'm trying to contemplate the effect of that. Yeah, because, because you can't if you can't unless there's a contrary motion, and you don't get seven, then the effect is that that motion Correct. is defeated. Right. So somebody make a contrary motion. But you can't defeat it, except with three. Four. So, so but this was but this was a I support ask, this was a supportive motion though. Can let me ask a little question. I think matters is that is that uh, um, if if the if the commission doesn't vote to su to support the findings of this panel, then do they automatically go into effect or they automatically get denied? The ordinance says that you shall be consistent with. So you are required to be consistent with the panel unless three quarters of you find. You, right. you must support it right. unless three quarters say no. So you have to identify. So, so this is what you're saying is we'd have to start with a negative motion. 
the motion that has to be made is to overturn the panel, right? Apparently. Uh, I, I, it's I, unclear to me. Well, that's what yeah, he's saying. No, he's yeah. saying that we have to sustain the panel unless we overturn them. We still have to make that motion. Paul still just still have to make that. That, yeah, you still have to make that motion. And I think that if we end up with a, a failed motion, then the, the default is that you you effectively approve it because the, the ordinance says you shall, right. your decision shall be consistent with the conclusions reached by the economic review panel. Well, that supports council's observation that the ordinance right. is as clear as mud. <laughs> you just helped him out. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. I think it's clear. It's just maybe not desirable. You shall be consistent. Your your decision shall be consistent. That's why. So what? That's why our vote we really did. Our, our vote really did do that, but we it have, was in a backward way. I've got the old ordinance here. If you want. Look at it. Yeah. I, just, I have a I have a copy for everyone, so you can keep that one. That would be nice. So does, do you want to just, do you want us to somebody make a, Somebody make a contrary yeah, motion, so see if we get seven. So yeah. someone who voted against this should so, make the contrary you know, yeah, motion? Yeah, I think so, and that's why I vote no. Because the, 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 the motion was to support. Right. right. So, okay. So, so can so. someone make, that voted no make the contrary motion? So I voted no. Well, I would like to read the, the ordinance first. <sighs> I just want to be absolutely sure. I know I don't look trustworthy. I could read it verbatim. You're an attorney. You're inherently not I'm not that guy. I resemble that <laughs> It's uh It's just a strangely it's worded. Sub three. It is strangely worded. That doesn't mean it's unintelligible. It's K three sorry. It's K3C3. Sounds like it is. It's on, it's on page it 17 says. of 20. That's what it says. Okay. What do you think we did? It, did that part right so far? <laughs> Anyways. It's a strange thing, but that's what it says. Yeah, it's weird wording. David, I hear you having, um, making some comments about Rehabilitation cost per square footage. Would well, you like I've done a little analysis here, looking. I using, did likewise. I think using I, the applicants' numbers yep. and the cost breakdowns uh, that were included with the economic hardship material, and the square footage uh, that's also noted on the applicants' uh, mm -hmm. thing. And it's kind of interesting. There are three of these buildings that the the cost to renovate is sky high. It's like out of the ballpark, and then there's there's one that's like rehabable, and then there are two that are kind of in the middle, they'd probably work with tax credits. Um, but there are three here that using these numbers are just, you know, using the applicant's own numbers, which, you know, take it or leave it, whether you believe them or not. Um, they're way high. Mm -hmm. And one that's, I think, kind of low, and the other two that are kind of in the middle. So I'm just the observation. Um, I, hit, <clears throat> I, I did the same thing with their numbers mm -hmm. to get those square footage costs and also yeah, I came up a high of six hundred and fourteen dollars a square foot for, and this, these are round. So they call it mm -hmm. six hundred, you know, uh, two sixty-two Bishop's Place, um, and a low of two hundred nineteen dollars for two forty-nine Bishop's Place. Everything else is in between, um, and I don't know. I suppose based on that, we could do a contrary motion, building by building. Um, to the findings of the economic hardship panel, and uh, we could start with a, with the easy one, which is 249, and see if that flies. And if it doesn't, doesn't, then I doubt any of the others will. Yeah, yeah. we can go one at a time. That's fine. You can you, you can choose to, you can choose to break it if you want. I mean, um, I, I'd be happy it, to lump them together as three and three, but. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm thinking if the, if the cheap one doesn't go, then uh, then none of them will. Your your call. You're you're the one that can make the motion. I I think either. <clears throat> I'm wondering.
you know, the, the, the per square foot cost is an aggregate of many things. It, uh, it I, don't is. Know if we need, I don't know if we need to dive into a deeper specific, you know, like I have a note here on, the, on that lowest one, the 249, that the foundation was only, uh, you know, foundation work was only 2750 a square foot, where some of them, and there was one that was just astronomical, probably that 262, $93 a square foot. Right. For the foundation work. And these are off their numbers. Some of them have huge not. excavation costs, and some of them, quite frankly, they're so small. They're so small that the cost skyrockets. Right. Hmm. But I wonder if we need to go. I, I just have a, let me just throw it. something out here for, for, you know, my concern perhaps is that 432 North, 300 West, which we just uh, voted to support the findings for preservation of that building. You. The cost was estimated at $468 a square foot, um, which, you know, I, I find that one astronomically high too, um, you know, uh, or I mean, yes, you can spend that much, but you don't need to, to be able to. Mm -hmm. And so my concern is- Well, that brings is, up a good question. Do we want to go down that path? That's exactly yeah. the question I'm asking. Got it. I mean, are we, are we you know, cutting the legs out from underneath? So what, what you're gonna need to do in your Contrary motion is identify by a three-fourths majority what the arbitrary, how they act, the panel acted in an arbitrary manner or the erroneous findings of material facts. That's going to be your contrary motion. But Tom, I'm wondering, you know, you, you make the point about 432, and we've just supported its um, preservation or finding with the, with the review panel. Um, <clears throat> but we did not, necess we did not specifically um, reference the costs. their costs. Mm -hmm. If they choose to spend $200 a square foot or $800 a square foot, to renovate, to successfully renovate those buildings is kind of immaterial, I think. I mean, not to, not to them, obviously, but um, but is it is it immaterial to the finding that that we just supported the economic hardship panel review, economic review panel, economic whatever it is. <clears throat> so I'm not sure at this point whether. Um, a contrary motion is necessary. It's clear that there there aren't seven votes for it. So, well, so when, you know, and I'd surely make the argument that we've already approved it because it I'm, says it I says that do. we that the panel, the commission, will approve it, uh, must approve it unless two, three, four vote against it. So we made a motion to approve it, I'm, and over a fourth of us approved it. So that means the commission's approved it. I, I, I concur agree. with Commissioner Hyde. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I I'm, I'm wrestling with the same thing. Your vote was to approve. You shall. You didn't. Right. Um, the standard is that you find to the contrary by the three quarters and, and all that. But you haven't passed a motion yet. <clears throat> well, that's the problem. I you think we. Ha I think it well, says we shall, and we did. Well. Did not, we did. Three fourths didn't oppose the motion. We don't need a motion. Is is, is what I get. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Richard. Well, that's Robert. a different standard. Yeah. It doesn't say if three fourths oppose the motion. It says that you can find to the contrary if three fourths approve. It's a technicality. It's stupid. I think the effect of this is that you probably have. If if you believe if the commission believes that it's so As why don't we just tell Paul out and one of you over there make a motion? That I don't think we you. need to. I, I agree with you. I think it's then, done. Yeah. Then that's 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 where you stand. Yeah. Well, I know if you need a motion that's negative, we can figure one out here. So we can. Oh, um, we <clears throat> so we. Motion to close. Yeah, are we 
completed? I mean, is that so? Uh, make a motion to close. Okay. I don't know if we have to second that or not, but uh, <laughs> yeah. is there anything else to do? Does that leave? Does that so leave the city in a? It does. I'm sorry, a bind? I'm just yes. Don't have, like, I tell a, you, I need a motion, a motion that, that passes. <laughs> One way or the other, I, I need a motion that passes. But if we're not going to make a motion because it's futile, and it is a contrary motion, we're not going to do it. And so that means that by operation of law, it says that. that well, why, it passes. why are you all refusing to make the motion? Because you hope that it's defeated votes. that way. We have seven. We don't have seven votes. We know that it's a waste of time. But I know. You, well, it's not a waste of time if the have, city doesn't think we've you don't addressed have five the issue. Votes. But you guys are all talking at once. Sorry. <laughs> well, the first, the the uh, the masonry buildings were were at least the three the three that we approve. We agree with the economic hardship on there. They're kind of a no-brainer. It's black and white. It, it appears as though they're going to work. The others all fall into a gray area. I mean, we've, everyone agrees that anything is restorable. It's just not practical in all cases. Um, so they fall into the gray zone. And it's um, hard to make a motion there. Well, again, that's because then you're, you're viewing this as, as defeating the, the panel's recommendation by not acting on it because you know you're not going to have the votes and then okay okay here i'll make a motion really fast okay i can do this that'd All be right. helpful so i'm going to move in the case of the um, six properties where economic hardship was found i'm going to move that we not um, follow the panel's recommendation because their findings are inadequate completely inadequate and that is the that is what arbitrary and capricious means so they did act in an arbitrary and capricious manner and therefore, they inappropriately found economic hardship. So that's what I'm moving. We have a motion. Is there a second? All right. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any question, discussion? Rachel? Quist, yes. Harding, yes. Victoria, yes. Richardson votes aye. Stoll, yes. Peters, no. Tom. Brennan, yes. Hyde, no. So that was six, six to two. Contrary motion, correct? Mm -hmm. Motion fails. Motion fails, therefore we agree with the panel. We're, we're at a stalemate. If, unless somebody wants to re-vote on the first motion, then the effect is that you have approved it because you shall. Well, on the first motion, I don't know. We could just go through it again, but does it have to I mean, three quarters? They, there was be approved there. or yeah. unapproved. The was seven right. So, no. what what the ordinance says is that you shall reconvene to take final action on it. I mean, we're we're at a stalemate. Uh, the effect is that if there's a legal effect here, I guess if you're not going to make a motion to approve that. We had a motion. That you approved. have approved anyways because you shall approve. Can I make a motion that says our stalemate in votes really is effectively a, an approval? Go for it. <laughs> well, no, no, we're, it's, we're not mean, a legislative I don't know that it's going to be any more effective than doing, redoing the first motion. Well, the first motion was, it was a tie. No, it wasn't. Until I broke it. Oh, okay. The chair voted. I'm sorry. I, yeah. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I thought the chair was supposed to vote in this as part of the quorum. A, the chair does. He did. Do you vote he broke the tie. This last one? I, I, no, not this time. Only in the event not of a this tie. Time. Only in case to break a tie. All right. All right. But we've had what so far? I don't. No, that was in the in the first one. <laughs> first motion. I voted no. If if the chair were to vote in one manner. Seventy-five percent. If you were to vote in the other, right? But I can't. But I can't vote because it's because it's not. Well, it's not a tie situation, and it would never. You can't tie up to no. a seventy-five yeah, percent. Not a tie to break. Okay. I'm. I, I see this as a legislative problem, not a problem of our board. <clears throat> Yeah. 
I don't know why you say that. I, 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 we didn't create if, this law. If you're not going to take another, you're not going to make another motion. We're effectively done here. Okay. All right. Move to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Yep. I think we're done.